New Hampshire House remains deeply divided over the failure of its budget. The speaker has compared the legislative tactics of the Freedom Caucus to terrorism, and some members of the Freedom Caucus have been talking about challenging the speaker's leadership. Keep in mind, this is all happening within the Republican Caucus, fighting over whether the budget they crafted is conservative enough. Last week, we had two members of the Freedom Caucus on. This week, we can say the establishment strikes back. We are joined by Representative Neil Kirk, Chairman of House Finance, and Representative Dan Eaton, longtime state rep from Stoddard. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Our pleasure. Thanks. So, uh, Representative Kirk, uh, you've long been known to have some of the sharpest fiscal talons there at the State House, and yet, in this situation, you find yourself being called not conservative enough. What is, what's your take on that? Uh, I don't think it's a question of being conservative or not conservative. There are a, group, a small group of Republicans in the in the party caucus, one third, one sixth, depending on the vote, who have different ideas about what a responsible govern, a uh, responsible budget is, and I guess the majority of the party sees things differently. Uh, this is a normal kind of. Uh, disagreement between a big tent party and eventually we'll resolve it. And yet an abnormal result. This is the first time in recent memory that the House was unable to pass a budget. Yes, we did. We were unable to pass a budget, either House Bill 1, which is the dollars in the budget, and House Bill 2, which is the legislative policy. Um, House Bill 1 was defeated with roughly two-thirds of the Republicans supporting it and one-third in opposition. But House Bill 2 was quite different. About five-sixths of the Republicans supported it and one-sixth didn't. Um, indeed, about 15 Democrats joined the Republicans and it nearly passed. There was only a six or seven vote difference. So the kind of thing we're seeing now, you're right, is quite unusual. Um, and it's due to the fact that there are some very principled individuals uh, on the Republican side who want the, want the world their way and, and at this point have not been willing to uh, accept the majority's position. Uh, Representative Eaton, uh, your sense of things, uh, uh, again, w when this budget that was crafted is being called not conservative enough. Uh, Any time that they say that Representative Kirk is not conservative enough, I think it's a bizarro world. It reminds me of some sort of Seinfeld episode. <laughs> um, and the speaker may have been criticized for his comments. Uh, he has nothing to apologize for. There's a group that are very principled, as Representative Kirk said, and there's also a group that's a bunch of anarchists that are not re truly Republic Republicans. Uh, they don't have a real decision as to what needs to be done or not done, such as they want the budget reduced, but they can't say how or where. They won't participate in the process. They didn't ask to go on the Finance Committee. They don't have any specifics. They pulled a number out of the sky and said, we'll cut that. And when asked where to cut, they all give you a deer in the headlights stare. That's not responsible government. And some of these people truly do not believe in government whatsoever. And I guess for the regular person out there, they may not be aware that there's a process here that's been going on for three months when this input could have been given into the process. Representative Kirk, did they come to you at all during that entire House budget process and say, we need to have spending uh, pegged to the rate of inflation? Uh, forget this 10%. Uh, no, except a week or so before, no, in the week that the House Finance Committee actually voted on the budget, I was contacted by one member who mentioned this, and I said it was a bit late at that point because all of the divisions had completed their work and the House Finance Committee was ready for its rather formal vote on the budget. So the answer is no, they really didn't come forward with, with this idea. They actually tried to do an end run around the Finance Committee and around the Speaker by going to the Governor's office and saying we want $300 million knocked off of the budget. Same thing the governor's office said, tell us where, we'll work with you. They could not give a single answer, again, deer in the headlights, uh, we're not willing to participate in the detail process or do the work. They want to come from the outside and throw a rock, but they don't want to do the work process. And, and indeed, one of the members uh, said specifically they didn't want to accept responsible for the con responsibility for the kinds of reductions that would have had to be made to meet their, their criteria. And by the way, Adam, their criteria were very, very wrong. Um, Rather than use the traditional method of comparing bud one budget to another, they chose one section of one part of the budget and said, this went up too much, this section itself has to be reduced to the rate of inflation. Of course, they didn't have a real sense of what the rate of inflation was. They used, um, I'm not sure actually what they used, but by all the standards that we use, Northeast, uh, CPI, consumer price index changes or something like that, they didn't have any of those. So uh, it was a bit 
of a grenade thrown at the last minute and frankly surprised me. And the di there are differences between the governor's budget, the House budget was more conservative. We can look at some of the differences here. You, you cut kindergarten entirely. Uh, there was a big chunk of the infrastructure spending that was cut down. Uh, you made a modest cut in uh, the de developmental disability services that you, uh, the governor had in there and you had the 15, $50 million worth of tax relief. Um, from your perspective, this was a conservative budget. It was a very conservative budget, and one of the reasons we made reductions from the governor's budget is that our revenue estimates, the estimates of what our future revenue would be, what we could spend, were $59 million lower than the governor's estimate. So right off the bat, the House Finance Committee had to reduce the governor's budget by $59 million. In addition, the speaker determined that we needed to provide property tax relief, the $50 million you mentioned. And so we had to find another $50 million of either reductions or additional revenue revenue in order to meet that. So our budget was the kind of budget that we always produce. We lived within the revenues that we expected to get. There were no new taxes. There were no new fees. It was a live within your means budget. Um, it was conservative in the sense that we did that, but it certainly spent more money than we're currently spending. But if you compare the spending in this budget with past budgets, we're up something, but not a significant amount, something that is about the rate of inflation. As, at least as most people calculate the rate of inflation. Towards the end of the week there, we saw this another salvo sort of here with the speaker, uh, you know, his chief of staff sending a letter to the House Republican Alliance, essentially saying that they're an advocacy organization and they can't necessarily have meeting space in the State House anymore. What are your thoughts on this, Representative Kirk? And you can weigh in too, Representative Eaton, but does this need to stop or is this just sort of the speaker's prerogative of the few things they can control or seating uh, office space and that he's just kind of taking his toll there. I think there were some technical issues that the House Republican Alliance had not fulfilled. That is, that they have to have a set of bylaws and things of this nature. And I suspect that when they comply with those things, they will be uh, back in the House. I, I don't want to comment on that too much because there are some differences and there are some personalities and there are some problems. But let's look at this from the big picture point of view. Although the House budget was not passed by the House, it will form a very important part of the budget that comes out of the Senate and that ultimately goes to the Committee of Conference. There's an understanding between the House and the Senate that all of the work that the House Finance Committee did will be considered as part of the Senate budget so that it will be on the table at the time uh, we have the Committee of Conference on the budget. It's not that the House is being frozen out. The other thing is this is a, a really a three-part process in the budget. The governor goes first, the House second, and the Senate third. Each of these parts builds on the other one. The House budget built substantially on what the governor did. Yes, we had somewhat different priorities, but many of his were met. The Senate will do the same thing with the, with the House Finance Committee budget. So at the time we go to a committee of conference, everybody's points of view, the governor, the House Finance Committee, and the Senate's point of view will be there, and we will do as we traditionally have done, develop a budget that's best for the state of New Hampshire. And Representative Eaton, provide us some historical perspective here. Where are we in the decades you spent in the House? Uh, this is a pretty rare situation. In. It's the first major train wreck I've seen in the process. And again, you go back to the bizarre world where the Democrats were put in a position of essentially supporting the governor's budget. There's, we wanted to move a few chairs on the deck, uh, but we supported his revenues. And frankly, the history at the moment is proving the governor's revenues were not only accurate, but possibly low. The House has a history of being 7% low in revenue numbers. Uh, we wanted to add in the governor's uh, uh, kindergarten, we wanted to eliminate the DD wait list, and we wanted to support domestic violence uh, or funding to the uh, domestic violence uh, coalition. The um, it's rare that you have the Republicans saying uh, a newly elected Republican governor is dead wrong in his budget proposal, and the Republicans are the ones raising the flag for the governor. Will the Democrats, uh, though, support the governor's budget? Are we going to see, essentially, if the Freedom Caucus remains recalcitrant, are the Democrats going to support whatever comes out of the Senate, do you think? That's way too wide open. <laughs> that, uh, we you have certain more. goals we want put in. I think probably the Senate shares a lot of those. I think the Senate president is very concerned about the DD wait list and wanting to eliminate that. Uh, and the Senate already passed a bill into the House to take care of the kindergarten. Uh, so that may not even be a budget issue. So a lot of what we are looking for, I think, will be dealt with uh, in the Freedom Caucus. If the Committee of Conference comes out reasonable and we get 50% of what we're looking for, I think the uh, Freedom Caucus will be marginalized.
All right, gentlemen, this has been uh, very educational. I'm sure we'll have you back again uh, at some point to discuss what, how this all plays out. But thank you very much, Representative Kirk and Representative Thank Eaton. you. Any